I, Johnny, saw a mighty number. Well, up in the middle of the air, I, Johnny, saw a mighty number. Elvis Presley. To some, he was a larger-than-life celebrity, but to his friends, he was a humble man who spoke often of his desire to fulfill God's purpose for his life. Join me as we examine this often overlooked yet fundamental facet of Elvis's life. This is He Touched Me, the gospel music of Elvis Presley. Lead me, oh Lord, won't you lead me? Holy, holy, hallelujah. Rock, rock, yeah. rock, oh, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. rock on my soul, why don't you rock on my soul? <laughs> Hello, I'm Sander Van Oker. Welcome to our exploration of Elvis's fervent love of gospel music. If you're not well acquainted with Elvis's career, it might surprise you to know that he received only three Grammy Awards, all three recognizing his gospel performances. He took great pride in knowing that the sacred performances, as they were once called, had met with favor by his peers. In a previous program, we presented his gospel heritage, his spiritual roots in the Assembly of God Church, and his fervent love of Southern gospel and black gospel music. With the help of many who knew him well, we've charted his rise to fame and his struggle to remain a normal person. We now continue our pilgrimage at the height of his fame as he played to packed houses in Las Vegas. I'll remember you It's a true foundation. Elvis's opening night in, I think, 1969, they had invited the, the world of celebrities from, you know, anybody that was anybody, movie stars, uh, sports stars, whatever. And J.D. was one of the people that Elvis invited to that opening night. So the group had an off night in Las Vegas so J.D. could go attend this opening night with Elvis. How cool was that? And then J.D. said, you know, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw straws and whoever Draws, the shortest straw can go backstage with me after the show and meet Elvis. Well, I won. So I got to go backstage and meet Elvis. That was the moment that I looked at this guy and it was like he was the most perfect looking individual. And, and I, he was such a celebrity. I was like totally awestruck. He was so nice. It really made an impact on me. Elvis sang his traditional hits out of uh, command. Colonel would make him sing certain songs because that was what his popularity was based upon when he started. Elvis referred to Hound Dog and Blue Suede Shoes, those kinds of songs. He referred to it as bubblegum rock and roll himself. That thing inside of him that made him want to reach out and help somebody was the thing that made his gospel presentations on stage so very, very powerful because he understood the principle of what goes out will accomplish what it was designed to do without coming back unfulfilled. He knew that principle. And therefore, when he would sing songs like Help Me, he was not only feeling what he was singing, he was expressing to someone out there the, the sure and certain knowledge that if they've got a mess, there is somebody that can help them. He stayed on top of what was happening with uh, Southern Gospel. He really did love that music. So those are the songs he sang. Or a song maybe that Donnie Sumner or uh, a Joe Muscale or someone would turn him on to say, listen to this Elvis, and Elvis would love it, he would learn it, then he would sing it for a hundred times over the next month. <laughs> I believe in the man in the sky. The man in the sky. I believe with his hand I'll get by. Steps may falter, my eyes may grow dim, but he's my Gibraltar, 
I'm trusting in him. I don't think I've ever met anyone who loved music as much as he did, and that is what I admired about him. Not, not the fact that he was this great star, but the fact that he was so special in that this was not something he was doing for money. He literally... The gospel album with the Imperials, and uh, he took a break there for about an hour and a half or so in the editing room. We did nothing but discuss the history of gospel music, and, and he told him that that was his ambition. That's what he loved to do. And I said, well, why don't you do it? He said, no, nah, I said, I looked at thousands of people to be out of work if I did that. He was able to, to carry gospel music to the, you know, to the level that he did because he, you know, through having the Jordanaires, the Imperials, the Stamps uh, sing, you know, with him, introduced gospel music to hundreds of thousands of people. I think Elvis wanting to be in the Blackwood Brothers when J.D. was there and because J.D. was his hero, it just it never, ever went away. I guess once you develop a hero, and, and in Elvis' eyes, J.D. only got bigger in his career. I don't think he ever thought that he was bigger than, than J.D. I think maybe he always thought that J.D. was always a little bit bigger than he was, you know? Many times on stage, he would come over to when he started to introduce me, and he would say, ladies and gentlemen, here's a Here's a man that I've known since I was 14 years old. He's the greatest bass singer in the world. And said, I never thought I'd get to share his stage. He said, thank you, J.D., for letting me share your stage. And I had about two feet, and he had, you know, he had to rest the stage. But that's the kind of a man he was, you know. J.D. was noted as the world's lowest bass singer, and Elvis really took pride in that. He would do everything he could that have a, had a bass line in it so he could hear J.D. sing. If he were to sing any gospel songs on stage or anything he would do on stage or off stage, it'd be something connected with J.D. Sumner. So J.D. could hit a low note or, uh, because that was his love. He, he loved, uh, he was a, well, he wanted to be a bass singer and he wasn't. He said, you know, Ray, the Lord really messed up on me when it didn't make me a bass singer. I thought, yeah, right. That's really cool. <laughs> His favorite thing to do was to gather around the piano and, and harmonize. And he loved the old, uh, you know, gospel songs, the Negro spirituals, he, and anything of that nature, he would want to sing and harmonize, and uh, harmonize together with us. And he'd always come over and, 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 and show J.D. and myself both that he could also sing the laws and sing bass as well. We did this uh, Bosom of Abraham. This is where, uh, among the Elvis fans and among uh, kind of the family, so to speak, that's where old, old uh, Elvis put the squeeze on old J.D.'s head when he got there singing it, because he was doing the bass, and Elvis was running, singing, the, kind of singing the bass octave above him. <laughs> Typical of his mischievous nature was a joke played on J.D. Sumner and the Stamps in Las Vegas. While they were performing poolside at a hotel on a live telethon, Elvis and his entourage were watching them on television from his penthouse suite. Early on, when the Stamps began 
backing Elvis. They were in Las Vegas. And as usual, they were, you know, everyone was going up to the suite afterwards to sing and, and you know, share time together and that. But J.D. had promised Bill Sharp, who was a, a pastor of an Assembly of God church in, in Las Vegas, that he and the Stamps would come over and do a few songs on his telethon that he was having at the landmark across the street. So Daddy spoke to Elvis after the show, after the second show, and said, we won't be able to come up to the suite. We've got to, you know, go do this telethon for Bill Sharp. And Elvis said, oh, great, everybody upstairs, the guys are going to sing the telethon. We can all watch them on TV. So the, the Stamps went across the street, and they they were poolside because it was, you know, the telethon was done outdoors. And, and um, they sang... They began singing, you know, songs, and one of the girls working on the telethon came up to Daddy and said, there's a man on the phone that says he's Elvis Presley, and he wants to do, you know, some requests, or have y'all do some requests, and Daddy said, that is probably Elvis Presley. <laughs> he's across the street, you know, and what does he want us to sing? So Elvis just loved it. He set up on the 30th floor of the Hilton, playing producer or whatever, and he would tell the stamps what songs to sing. So they sang for like an hour. And he just, you know, loved every minute of it because he was calling shots. I mean, he was just in charge. And so after they sang for like an hour, the girl came over and whispered to my dad and she said, Elvis said he would donate $2,500 if all the members of the stamps would jump in the pool. And so Daddy said he took three steps and just dove into the pool, and the guys just went right after him. Now there are people on reservation and out in the ghetto. And brother there. For the grace of God, go oh, you and I. Uh -huh. Well, if I only had wings, I'm a little angel. Don't you know I'd fly to the top of a mountain and then I'd cry, cry, cry to walk a mile in my shoes. To walk a mile in my shoes. Yeah, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. I believe it was 75, and, and uh, Elvis had to leave the stage, so he just said, J.D., take over, and he just sort of threw him the ball, and here we are with TCB band and those guys and the orchestra, Sweet Inspirations and ourselves, and, and, and J.D. took the show and, and started entertaining the people. He got us out there to sing a few songs, just enough to kind of keep it rolling. When Elvis returned, uh, and this is just kind of what he was, he was in awe that the audience wasn't upset because he left, and they were some way kind of pleased. We got back on stage, of course, the audience gave an ovation to him. Uh, he reached over and gave J.D. that big old, uh, he had a big old ring with a TCB on it and uh, had a, I believe it was a 15 karat diamond in the center of it. Uh, it was one of the last things that Elvis bought for himself that he really liked. It was a huge old ring and he gave it to J.D. You know, tried to cram it on J.D.'s fingers. You know, J.D.'s got big old fat hands. And it was, uh, that just sort of explains his from A to Z kind of how he was, you know. Just, he was very erratic about what he did, but he, he wanted everybody to have the very best, and that's a $40,000 gift is what I mean. When J.D. needed to replace his worn-out tour bus, Elvis was quick to act, summoning the lanky bass singer to his bedroom where he often conducted business. Daddy sat down, you know, across from Elvis, and Elvis tore out a check out of his checkbook and gave it to my dad and said, here, I know you need a new bus, so I want you to make the check out. 
And Daddy got tears in his eyes, as he generally was known to do when he was so, you know, emotionally moved and everything. And he said, I can't make this check out. This is your check. And he said, well, you can write, can't you? Make the check out. I know you need a bus. I want to buy you a bus. The only thing I want to do is when you get the new bus, I want you to bring it to Memphis and let me drive it, which is exactly what he did because I was on the bus that night. The Stamps had gone over to Memphis to a football game, and they drove the bus out to Graceland. Elvis got on it and got behind the wheel, and Daddy thought, oh, my Lord, he's fixing to drive my brand-new bus. And Elvis took off down Elvis Presley Boulevard and took the, the bus for a big whirlwind drive. And, and I think Daddy said that he wasn't, the way he was watching Elvis, he, he could tell that Elvis wasn't quite sure he could back the bus up or turn it, you know, like turn it around or whatever. So he turned, he did turn left, because Elvis was a truck driver, you know, in, in his youthful days. And he went through this big field, and Daddy said, as, they, as we were bouncing through the field, he thought, oh, there goes my new bus, <laughs> or whatever. But when they got back to Graceland, the bus was in good shape, and Elvis was thrilled to death. And he, and he said, well, you kept your word. And Daddy said, yeah, and so did you. When you walk through a storm Hold your head up high And don't be afraid of the dark The Imperials never met a kinder man, a more generous man, who really cared about people and uh, made us feel so welcome every, every time we were with him. And, loved life and, and loved people, and um, uh, where that places him in the kingdom or in God's care is only for God to know, but I know, I know that he was, he was a good man to us, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed working with him. Well, I'm sure people wonder, you know, was it a you know, big grandstanding? I mean, is he just trying to impress people? Did he give, you know, give some waitress a car or, you know, some servant a, a, a car or do something, pay their hospital bill or, you know, or, or you, you hear all these stories, you know, but until you actually, you know, actually feel it and you know the sincerity of it, I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. I mean, he did some nice things for us. He always took good care of us. We always stayed in nice hotels. Um, he gave us some nice things, but they weren't, I think I, I cherish the things that he gave me because I know that he didn't give these to everybody. 